Uh, today's conversation, as you know, the on Monday nights we go through the conversations of the Quran. Today's conversation comes from Surah Yasin. Surah Yasin is a Makki surah. Surah Yasin has, since it is a Makki surah, it talks about the life hereafter, it talks about the risala of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it talks about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it talks about the, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In addition to that, if you look at the surahs that come afterward, surah Safat, because once again, the Prophet sallallahu is all about risala and the messages of the previous prophets, surah Safat talks extensively about the stories of the past, and then Surah Yasin talks about the Day of Judgment, and SubhanAllah, the Surah after Surah Safat, Surah Saad talks about the Day of Judgment extensively. So you see that there is a lot of symmetry when it comes to the Quran. Surah Yasin begins with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala talking about the purpose of the Quran, the objective of the Quran. He talks about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being sent as a prophet and how there will be people who will completely reject and deny the message, even though it is a clear message of Islam, a clear message of the Quran and of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And not only that, but Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ There is like a wall in front of them, there's a wall behind them, and they are completely blind, they cannot see, and they have been covered from the top. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is the state of the affairs of certain people. Now, imagine if you're reading any book, any book, and you read a formula, usually what happens after that is, the author, he brings an example to help understand or to help explain the formula. So Allah talks about an issue. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brings a story in the Quran, in Surah Yasin, to help us understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. So Allah brings a story of the past. Now, interestingly about this conversation, we have no idea, really, we have no idea when did this story take place. We have no idea what is the name of this town, though, theoretically speaking, some of the ulama of the Mufa or the, some of the ulama of tafsir, they have perhaps given a name to this town based on, once again, there is no hadith of the Prophet saying this. This is just a theory of theirs that this area is named as Intaqiyah. It's mentioned in some books of taf uh, tafsir. And so, Wallahu alam, what is the name of this town? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he sent there some prophets. What is the name of these prophets? This is also unclear in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he begins the, the passage by saying, إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا There is a town. Now the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَصْحَابَ الْقَرْيَةِ Because Allah wants us to remember the town in itself. The people at that time, they should remember that town. Why? Because people will come and go. A town does not come and go. The town remains. When people come and go, if the story is just about the people, if the people are gone, the story will eventually go away too. The story will be forgotten. But when Allah is talking about a certain town, as long as that town is in existence, the people will keep on talking about the story that took place in this town. You see, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very precise in his words in the Quran. لَهُمْ مَثَلًا not, not أصحاب, He said Ashab al qarya but he did not just say Ashab. He said Ashab al qarya The reason he mentioned qarya is because every single person who will come to that town, they should remember. Just like when we go to different places, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he would travel with the Sahaba and he would say, this is a place where the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down. He's not talking about the people, but he's talking about the land where the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down upon them. So that is what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about, and this is what exactly Allah is talking about in the Quran. Allah says, إِذْ جَاءَهَ mursalun." There were prophets that were sent to these people. How many prophets were sent? Allah says, إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِ مثنين. Allah first sent two people to go and give da'wah to the people of this town. When these two people were openly rejected, Allah says, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ We gave them strength. 
See the word azazna, another word that can come from the word azazna is al-aziz. Okay? Al-aziz comes from the word azazna. Aziz means the one who is mighty, the one who provides power, the one who has the authority in his hands. He's the one who gives power, who takes away power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, fa'azazna bi thalith. We gave that that group of two people, we gave them more reinforcement and hence now they became three. And now when they became three, now they are going and they are giving da'wah. Now, interestingly, something else to be learned from this, from this ayah here is, Allah did not say, I sent two, there is a third one and now the third one is the leader. Allah did not mention anything about a hierarchy. Allah did not mention that out of the two, the first one or the second one is in charge and the other two are not in charge. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this? Because this could cause some kind of friction. One is in charge, he orders the other two. No, when people come together to give da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, it should not be about competition. It's about ikhlas. When people work together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should only be for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ Now these three, as a jama'ah, as a group, they went and they began to give da'wah. What happened? Of course, as we see in any story in the Qur'an, they got a lot of pushback. And the general perception of the people at that time was, if you're going to send, if God is going to send someone to invite mankind to Him, why would He send human beings? You're just like me. Why would he send you? Rather, he should send malaika. He should send some other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is exactly what they said. They said, قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ لَا تَكْذِبُونَ Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way, in the Quran also, when he talks about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that this was a common complaint even in the time of the Prophet sallallahu But the reason why Allah would send, first of all, interestingly, Allah will always send a prophet from within that group of people. Why? Because if they were sent another person who speaks a totally different language, then there will be a communication barrier. That's number one. But number two is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always sent a human being. Why? Because Allah wants them to understand that He's a human being. He has a family. He lives. He drinks. He produces and so forth. He marries and produces and so forth. Just like you. If He can believe in Allah, so can you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, subhanallah, you know, people till today, you'll find many times people they have the same perception about imams. Wallahi, I kid you not, I'm standing right here. This is 2024. 2024. Last week, last week, I was right here in Kroger. Okay? A guy came to me, he goes, oh, you come here and shop? And I'm like, yes. May insan hu. Okay? I'm a human being. I shop. Maybe kato, maybe pita hu. Okay? I have to go. I have needs. Okay? I have to come and shop also. But it was shocking that this is 2024 and a person is telling me this is like no different. Wallahi, when he said this to me, I said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبَلَكَ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا إِنَّهُمْ لَيَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشُونَ فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ the, the, the people that a long time ago, they said the same thing. These are prophets. Why are they eating? Why are they going in the bazaars and so forth? So once again, this person, he said this, and you know, once again, this is what the mindset was. I mean, Allah should have said angels. Now, this, these people, what did they say? رَبُّنَا قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ Allah knows that we have been sent as prophets to you. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example of usually what happens. You know, have you seen people when they get together, when they do da'wah, you know they, they put those da'wah booths together? You've seen this, right? Yes or no? The da'wah booths, they're sitting there giving out the pamphlets. They have a Qur'an. You're going to have one guy who is, mashallah, very, you know, he's an energetic da'i and so forth. He's going to open up the Qur'an. He's going to open up the Bible. He's going to open up and show all the fallacies in the Bible. He's going to open up in the Qur'an and say, you see, there's no fallacies in the Qur'an and so forth. You're going to, you know, you find those kind of people. Now imagine there's one person, and I've seen a lot of videos like this. There's a person who is very calm in their approach, okay? They're very calm in their approach. And he's talking to another person. Now, when that person gets stuck 
and they have no answer, you begin to see them getting red, okay? Because they don't have an answer. They're getting embarrassed, right? So, they, so first, it's, it's just getting red. Then after that, when the frustration builds up, then it shows in, then the frustration builds up. At that time, it comes out in their words. You can see the frustration in their words. First, it was just apparent on their face. Now, you see that in their words. Verbally, they're starting to say things. They're starting to raise their voices. And you know what happens after that? If someone is really obnoxious, they're going to say, you know what, but you Muslims, you're the one who's causing all the problems. Like right now, if you know, if you have been in touch with the news and social media, you know that right now in the UK, there's a lot of rights going on. There are a lot, there's a lot going on right now. And you'll find all these people who are Islamophobes, the right wing and so forth, they're going to say that we had our country. Our country was doing perfectly fine until these Muslims came into this country, okay? These Muslims, they do this, they do that. They destroy the infrastructure of the, of the society. They cause all the problems and so forth. And by the way, it's not the Muslims. If you know the story on the back end, it's not the Muslims. It's other people who are causing the issues. It's happening. What's happening is that the Muslims are playing a lot of defense, but the society and the media is portraying the Muslims as if they are the ones who are playing offense. You understand? As if they are the aggressors. They're just playing defense here at this point right now. So the point is that you see they start to become aggressive. And when they become aggressive, it gets to the point where they cross all the limits. Okay? Now you see this happening often. Even, as I said, going back to the Dawah booth situation, you see people getting frustrated. I've seen, you know, especially this happens a lot in the UK, where you'll find a lot of people getting, you know, street Dawah, and they're just, you know, there's a lot of clashes and so forth. People going back and forth and so forth. There's a lot of yelling and screaming and so forth. Now you see, subhanAllah, even at that time, the same exact thing happened to these people too. Listen to the verse of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, These people they said, Wama alayna illa We have come and we have here we are here to convey a very simple and clear and constructive message. That's all we're here for. What did they say? Qalu, they said, Inna bikum. You are the ones who are the bad luck here in this place. Once again, does it make sense? Does it, does it sound familiar? When these people, they said, you Muslims are the problems here in this society. These people, they said the same thing. Inna You are the problems over here. You're the ones who are bringing the bad luck to our community in our society. tantahu. If you don't stop this, look at their threats. Lanarjumannakum. We will stone you. You see, once again, these people, when a person, when you're giving da'wah to some person, and they don't have any response, the, the last resort that they're going to come down to is they're going to threat you with their life. They're going to threat you of your life. This is because why? They don't have an answer to your questions. They don't have an answer when you ask them a simple question. So this is how they respond. And they said, We're going to inflict upon you a severe punishment. Now, what did these, now keep in mind, one thing is, what, did, what was their response? The problem is not with us. These da'is, these three people, they're saying, You are the problem. No, we are not the problem. If you are not given good counsel, then, he, then they said, In fact, you are the ones who jumped from just talking to killing and inflicting pain and stoning us. If there's anyone here who's wrong, it's you guys. Now, the key thing here is to understand as Muslims, as Muslims, we see that in the Quran, Allah is talking about this erratic behavior is the behavior of the kuffar. This is not the behavior of the Muslim. However, in this day and age, we have seen that this nature, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمُ مُسْرِفُونَ This has become the nature, the behavior of the Muslims today. Let me give you an example. You know, many years ago, you all know that in, in France, there is a, a newspaper uh, agency. It's called Charlie Hebdo. I mean, you probably have heard about this. They usually have a habit of writing very nasty, derogatory things about different people, different things. One time, they wrote something about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They made a cartoon 
about the Prophet ﷺ, openly disrespecting Rasulullah ﷺ. What was the reaction? You see, once again, I've always said this. As Muslims, we need to be smart. Sahaba were smart. The Prophet ﷺ was smart. These people are saying too, that this is your behavior. This erratic behavior is your behavior. This is not the behavior of Muslims. But you see, you know what was the reaction when that happened? In Muslim countries, they're going down burning restaurants, KFC, kafir fried chicken. Okay, let's just burn this down also. This, let's burn this, let's burn this. Flipping cars over, destroying property. This is not the nature of a Muslim. I mean, do you know that in here in Dallas, I remember soon after that, there was an author of a writer, he used to work for the Dallas Morning News. He actually came and interviewed me after this. And he asked me that what is supposed to be the right reaction of, of the Muslim community. And I, and I told him that this is not the way Muslims should do things. And by the way, after that, there was another incident that took place. In fact, right here, in, right in our backyard, there was a very strong Islamoph uh, Islamophobe, Islamophobic lady. She came here in Garland and she put together an event. She put together an event called Drawing the Prophet Sallallahu And it was extremely, it was extremely um, uh, disrespectful and so forth. But we all said to ourselves, as Imams, we told all of us ourselves and we made sure that we tell all of our communities, no one goes there and engages with these kind of jahil people. You understand? Because this is what they want. That same author, you know, in the Dallas Morning News, you know what he wrote? He said, Muslims, please be smart. Muslims, please be smart. Why is it that we need a non-Muslim guy coming and telling us Muslims how we need to behave? You understand? So this is what we find in the Quran. The erratic behavior is not the nature of a Muslim. This is their nature. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى Then came from the, from, the place, from the corner of a town, a corner of that city, that same town, there came a man running. Now, I want you to think about this. Imagine if you have a party of people and you all are on one side and there's one person who turns their back against that entire group, they're gonna launch an attack and they're gonna launch an attack against that person. They're all are gonna attack that one person that you are supposed to be with us. How dare you turn your back against us and you go on the other side? You understand? So this is exactly what happened. A man is coming and telling them, these people, that my qawm, my qawm, my people, please understand, these people are legit. They are truly prophets. Listen to them. Obey them. Listen to their message. Convert to Islam. He himself converted to Islam. He took his shahada in front of everyone. Now, of course, this is a person of their own town. When he has turned their back against, him, against them, now they revolted against him. And at that time, Allah, they, they, he said, اِتَّبِعُوا مَنْ لَا يَسْأَلُكُمْ أَجْرًا these people, people come, they are always asking for things. These people are coming, fi sabilillah. They're not asking you of anything. Now, what happened was, he began to talk about himself. Basically, he's telling himself that how can I worship any other God? It is only befitting that I worship only one God. That one God who benefits the one who provides benefit, the one who provides harm, and in his control is everything. And he's telling himself, if I don't worship this one God, if I don't do this, then clearly I am the one who is in wrong. Now, when they revolted against him, what did they do? They killed him. They killed him. And now look at this. SubhanAllah, one thing we learn about this man is, even though he's at the end of his life, he's at the tail end of his life, even at that time, he's saying about, he's talking about his own people. He's being told, You have been entered, you have been given permission and admitted into Jannah. At that time, he never still referred to his qawm as these kafir people or these people who have gone far away and so forth. He's telling himself, 
قومي. I wish my قوم, I wish my people would understand what benefit I'm receiving. Now he's in a different realm altogether. He is receiving the benefits of Jannah, and he is saying, "I wish my قوم understood." What do they? What do they? What does he want them to understand? بما غفر لي ربي how Allah subhanahu wa taala forgave me وجعلني من المكرمين and He has made me amongst those who are the dignified. He has made me amongst those who are the extremely honored. So this is what this is the ending of this person. He passed away, and but the point is that there is subhanallah this one man. This one man who probably did not live a long life in his de- in his life, he did not live a long life as a Muslim. He may have lived a regular life, but as a Muslim, he did not live so much time. But till today, we remember this person in the Quran, and the lesson to be learned in this is that when people, when they strive for the cause of Allah, when they give their life for Allah, when they give their time for Allah, when they give their energy for Allah. Then that is the one that is going to be remembered at all times. The other people, and by the way, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "In kanat illa sayhatan wahidatan faidam khaminu." Some of the ulama they say that Allah Subhanahu destroyed the entire town. The town has been forgotten. The people has been forgotten. The town remains there. The people have been forgotten. But this one person, because of his dedication to faith, because of the fact that he stood against the entire society, because for him to stand up against the society is not easy. To go against your entire town that you have been part of is not easy. But he understands when it comes to right. Versus wrong, you need to always stand on the side of right, and he stood on the side of right, and because of that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala honored this man. And the lesson in this also finally is for us that no matter what the situation is, you know, I'm going to finish on this. I've had someone come to me not long ago, and they asked me a simple question, and I'm going to give a khutbah about this, by the way. Someone asked me a simple question: What is going to be the state of affairs of Muslims? Because we were having a general conversation about what is going on in society and so forth, and he asked me a simple question: Was what is going to be the state of the affairs of our youth, thirty, forty, fifty years into the future? Like, and we were having all sorts of this kind of discussions, and I told him one simple thing: I said that I don't think that we have a problem when it comes to the youth, when it comes to their finances. I think they will take care of themselves. But the biggest issue that I find about the upcoming generation. Is that they will be very afraid to speak the truth. They will be very afraid to speak the truth, because speaking the truth against the society, against what is norm, the norm in society, wallahi, this is why the Prophet says, "Afdalul jihadi kalimatu haqin inda sultanin jair." The greatest jihad is to speak the truth. In front of the tyrant, the society has become the tyrant. To stand up and say, "This is the hak. I'm going to stand by the hak, and everyone else is doing wrong." This is what personally I'm afraid of. I could be wrong, but this is what I'm afraid of when it comes to the upcoming generation. I feel that many of our youth, they're going to have iman in their in their heart to a certain degree, but for them to come out and speak the hak and speak the truth. It's going to become very difficult. I mean, I'm sorry to say this. If many imams, I'm sorry, I'm saying this even as an imam, but if you, if I look at overall imams and shiyukh and so forth, if many of the imams and the shiyukh are so afraid to speak the truth too nowadays, so many imams and shiyukh are so afraid to speak the truth, then what do I expect from others? This is what causes me, you know, you understand. This is what caused me that concern in my heart. I think about this all the time. What's going to happen if I cannot even speak the truth? Then the truth is always going to be hidden. The truth is going to be suppressed, and halas, no one, everyone's going to forget about the truth. And one thing, as I said, the last thing that we learned from the story was that this person, he said, "I'm going to stand on the side of the truth." They took his life. Allah honored him. We always need to teach our children to stand by the side of the truth and always learn how to speak the truth. I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant all of us the tawfiq to learn these stories from the Quran, to benefit from these stories of the Quran, and apply them in our life. Amin al alamin. Wa rizakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
ان المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما